Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, this edition of the Bic Life Podcast. My name is Ryan Stockton. I am joined, as usual, by my friend Scott McFeet. Hey, Scott. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you, too. All right, man. Well, hey, we're so glad that you could join us uh, for this month's episode where we talk about life and faith in Jesus from a Brethren in Christ perspective. We're going to be getting into a third installment of our series uh, on the three streams of influence of the Brethren in Christ, uh, theologically speaking, uh, with our guest Matthew Peterson here in just a minute. But before I get into that, I wanted to let you all know about some fun and exciting things we have going on for the podcast here. So uh, if you listened to last week, uh, last month's episode, uh, we mentioned our uh, new and revamped website, uh, BicLifePodcast.com. So we encourage you to go and check that out, BicLifePodcast.com. You'll see all of our episodes, ways to um, subscribe uh, and you know to, to the podcast, a uh, little about us section, just a little ways to get to know us a little bit better. And a new tab that we have on this website is a new tab called Support Us. Uh, so if you have spoken with us individually at a BIC event or something like that, you'll know we're an unofficial Brethren in Christ podcast. Uh, we are not sponsored or supported by the denomination. We are, in fact, sponsored and supported by uh, our own pocketbooks. <laughs> Ryan and Scott. Uh, Ryan, I'm Ryan. Uh, Scott and I pay for this out of our own pockets, and we are happy to do so. This is a labor of love for us. We are just thrilled to be able to do this. Uh, and to meet as many incredible people as we have. But if you have been listening to this podcast for a while and you are, are thankful for the content that we've been putting out and would like to assist us assist us in, in putting out more content for the growth of the Brethren in Christ denomination and God's church in general, we invite you to join us on Patreon. We just set up a Patreon account uh, and you can go to patreon.com slash Podcast. And there are three tiers for supporting the podcast. We try to make it really a low ask for anyone who wants to help us out here. So the first tier is the, uh, I think that one is pietist. The pietist tier is $1 per <laughs> month. You can support the Big Life podcast. Second tier is $2 per month. That is the Wesleyan tier. If you choose to support us in that way, you can do that. And the third tier at $4 a month is the Anabaptist tier of support for us. So we encourage you to check us out on Patreon. Uh, and and uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Wesleyan tier, Stay tuned. We're going to be talking about that here in just a minute. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, support us at the uh, Pietist, Wesleyan or Anabaptist tiers, $1, $2 or $4 a month to just help us cover the costs of uh, doing this podcast. Uh, one important thing to note is that we don't offer anything special for those who support right. us financially. <laughs> <laughs> maybe someday, maybe someday we'll have just merch a, and all this uh, kind of stuff. But a kudos, a thank you. Uh, you're yeah. awesome or you're yeah. super duper awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks yeah. so much for your help. You know, so yeah, you just kind of be earning our, 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 our gratitude, our thankfulness yeah. for support. Uh, but right now at this point, everyone gets the same great content every month. Uh, but if you choose to help us out, if you believe in what we're doing here and want to help us out in creating more content, we'd love to have you support us there on Patreon. So with all of that said, that was probably longer than we wanted to go on that. Let's get to the meat of what we are here for today. Mm -hmm. Matthew Peterson, thank you so much for joining us again, man. Third time. Welcome back. Yeah. Happy to be here. Three times. I guess <laughs> I get some sort of very minor that, award, right? That's a record. <laughs> I think they oh, call wow. that a turkey in bowling, right? Three strikes. Very yeah. good. So I, I, I'm, I'm a turkey then. We're well, the big life turkey <laughs> yeah, here. That's Matthew. credentials. All right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, you? I hope you all are ready to gobble up what I'm going to be talking about. Then. Oh, Whoa. <laughs> we can we can cut that out, right, Scott? We can cut that out. <laughs> uh, I might leave it in. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Well, hey, Matthew Peterson, it is so good to have you on again. For those who are unfamiliar, uh, Matthew joined us back on episodes 12 and 15 to talk to us about Anabaptism and Pietism, two major streams of influence, theological influence in the Brethren in Christ that kind of morphed and, and created come to help the Brethren in Christ be what they are today. Mm -hmm. And there's a third stream of theological influence, Wesleyanism, that Matthew is going to help us uh, talk through today so that we can just get to know ourselves more, where we've come from, why we are the way we are in the Brethren in Christ, uh, some of those things. So uh, so yeah, so Matthew, you, you put out uh, your third article about this. This is part yeah. of the 
Which series is this a part of that you put yeah. out? This is a series called The Three Streams, The Brethren in Christ Theological Heritage. Um, and I'm borrowing language there from Luke Kiefer Jr., who was a theologian in uh, Brethren in Christ and produced some awesome work that uh, I consult a few times. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So we will have a link to that article in our show notes that you can go and check out there, um, along with the links to the things we talked about at the beginning, our website and the Patreon account. So you can check out our show notes, one stop shop for any of the links that you'll need. Um, so Matthew, why don't you go on ahead and just get us started? Can you tell us a little bit about just kind of give us the 30,000 foot view? What is Wesleyanism? Where did the name come from? What is or some of the key yeah. aspects of it, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, a 30,000 foot view of John Wesley would be kind of like a white wig set across a background. <laughs> um, but um, uh, briefly, I get it. I get it. yeah, there we go. All right. Um, well, let's cut it there. Um, so uh, stepping back, maybe like the 35,000 feet. So you mentioned that we have three major traditions that influence us. Anabaptism, which is this movement that kind of is very focused on obedience to the teachings of Jesus. Um, that's kind of broad summary. You can go back to episode 12 and check that out. Um, then we had pietism, which we talked about last time I was here. Pietism is this idea about new life in Jesus. Um, and then we're going to talk about Wesleyanism, which kind of comes out of this pietism movement. So 30,000 foot view here. Uh, we have the pietists who emphasized that Christian life and practice were in need of revival and that we were seeking revival in that through a vital experience of God. Out of that kind of stew <laughs> of some sort, um, we have emerged these folks, Charles and John Wesley, who um, everyone kind of knows their names, um, but might not know too much about them. Um, briefly, they were hanging out in the Oxford area of England. This is kind of overseas from us. Um, and they started a pietist group to study the scriptures together near Oxford. Um, and they were studying scripture, they were practicing mutual accountability and other practices um, that are very pietistic. Uh, now, John goes, comes across the Atlantic over here to North America, and while he is on a boat, he encounters these people called Moravians, who are also pietists. These people, uh, he, he was impressed by their faith because as they're sitting in a boat getting tossed around by the waves, uh, he's like, we're going to die. And they're like, Okay, <laughs> so we'll get to see Jesus. Um, so he's wondering what's going on with these people, um, why why their hearts are so filled with joy in the midst of this kind of bizarre, dangerous experience. And a couple of years later, um, he's in church and someone's reading uh, writings by Martin Luther. So we checked off our whole reformer bingo card here, except leaving out John Calvin. Um <laughs> which the Wesleyans would probably be fine with. Um, but uh, uh, someone's reading from Martin Luther and he feels something in his heart. His heart, he uses this phrase, being strangely warned. And he recommits himself to living for the Lord and pursuing a holy life. Um, you get a bunch of other people that come along the way, but this idea of a holy life, of being, of having a changed heart that leads to holy living is essential for these Wesleyan tradition. Um, it spreads to North America, and you have what's called the Second Great Awakening, this movement where a lot of people are talking about this, talking about the idea that God wants you to be holy. He wants to change your heart. He wants to equip you for service to him. Um, and then all these different movements happen, and eventually us and the Brethren in Christ interact with those people in kind of mid to late 1800s. Uh, and then we adopt some of that language too. So that gets into our stuff there. So that's bird's eye view. Mm. And that was, so Charles and John Wesley, I'm looking at your article. That was, yeah. um, for people like me who like to know what, when we're talking about it, 1720s yeah. to 1730s. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that range there. So we're looking yeah. at you know, a little bit before the United States became a thing. Um, this is going on over there. Uh, John Wesley, uh, as well, he, he was a good pietist in the sense of, uh, after he had all these experiences, he started to feel called to preach among the coal miners and the poor um, and, and people who were outside of the usual church hierarchy. 
um, which is also a hallmark here. A lot of this stuff is very big amongst laity, amongst kind of ordinary folk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. One question real quick before we move off of uh, John Wesley. Yeah. I'm just curious. So in 1738, he said he felt his heart strangely warmed. Yeah. Do we like, what exactly does he mean by that? Cause um, this is man. So I don't know how this is going to sound, but like my first thought was like, Oh, that sounds like the book of Mormon where <laughs> you, you read, you read like the first page and like, Hey, if you're not sure the book of Mormon is true, you just ask the Lord and, and you'll feel a, a burning bosom. You'll feel your, <laughs> A burning inside you and and you'll know yeah. that it's true and you know so what what did what did john mean by that do we know yeah um i mean i'm sure that some folks have done a little bit more reading of what this experience was um exactly but i'd assume that um that's joseph smith there with the book of mormon um i'd assume that he's adopting kind of that same sort of language there mm. um that he's experiencing kind of this internal feeling like oh there's something to what i'm hearing right now uh, yeah. and um i think it was a commentary on galatians that he might have been listening to um at the time and feeling um sort of a stirring in his heart to respond to that i i think that that's probably setting aside what it might have felt like for him that it produces a response mm -hmm. to what he's encountering it's not just like oh this feels good and i go home yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. And from what I understand, um, that experience, the strange warming of the heart became kind of a hallmark might be too strong of a word, but it became mm -hmm. part of the, uh, Wesleyan and, and to a degree pietist movement to say that there's a, an experience that goes along with your conversion. Um, some might say, now this is something that uh, I want to go in and do some defining of terms here a little bit. And so maybe we can go into this second mm -hmm. work holiness. Um, yeah. Some might say that this might be the second work holiness where he was a believer already, but this experience was, was something that was not just an experience that he had that he can relate to people, but it's something that we should all experience. Like it became something that we should all, if we're going to call ourselves real Christians, we should have the second work holiness, second work of grace uh, experience, experiential uh, happening in our lives. It's, is that, is that, that's my understanding of it. Does that jive? Yeah. Does that sound ish to you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. You know, there's a tendency um, in, in uh, church movements in general um, to when someone has an experience and they are influential to say, that experience is what we all must have as that person had it. Um, and I, I think that if you move too far in that direction, then you lead to people doing that performatively. Um, but there's still something to say that Wesley experienced something that changed the trajectory of his life mm -hmm. and that we saw the fruit of that life change. Um, and, and I think that that should speak to us today, that, um, that that there's something to this where we should be experiencing God. We should be experiencing uh, his spirit and, and that that will produce spiritual growth. Um, but it might be might look a little bit different from person to person. Um, we can get into yeah. that a little bit more, too. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can talk a little bit about uh, that a little bit later. We also see that in some revival settings, right? When yeah. The first time you were here. Uh, we were talking about the Asbury revival because that was kind of yeah. going on around that time. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of uh, settings in revivalist settings where it's like, oh, here's here are, you know, looking back at a revival that happened. Here's what happened. These were this was the context. This is the this is what the, the, the soil was like, you know, to create such an environment. And so then we tried to go and replicate that over here. And it's like, well, that's not it's not exactly how revivals work, you know, <laughs> there's right. this manufacturing that goes on to try to replicate revivals and things like that. That's not to say that what happened in that revival was not uh, true and authentic and good. Um, but, you know, as we see with God's healing, Jesus's healing miracles in the New Testament, he rarely healed someone the same way twice. <laughs> you know, right. he, he did it lots of different ways and all that kind of thing. So yeah, trying to 
trying to pin down the spirit and how he's going to work is, yeah. you know, kind of like chasing the wind a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I kind of think so. Th th so like there's with the revival, that's a good example of it is people look at it and there's like, here's the bullet point of things that we have to check off in order for that mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think th the sense that I get from the scriptures is it's not so much that there's a set of bullet points that need to be pursued for revival or for encounters with the spirit so much as that there is a list of things that after the fact we can say that was legitimate because we have seen a change in attitudes, a change in recommitment to the Lord, um, growth in terms of the, the fruit of the spirit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we could look backwards and say, here's our bullet points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, to evaluate the, the the truth of it, to see, you know, as yeah. you were saying during when we were talking about that a couple episodes ago, yeah. just the the truth of the revival is in the is in the fruit. Does it lead mm -hmm. to actual change? Yeah. And uh, yeah, which is what we saw with John Wesley and his experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. very cool. Uh, so <clears throat> a couple of other terms uh, I'd like to get into. One of them. Uh, so on your on the second page of your PDF of your article, uh, yeah. you're, we're talking about holiness, and then in that in in this uh, particular paragraph that I'm looking at here, you you start capitalizing holiness. Yeah. Um, we move from holiness as a concept to holiness as a movement. Can mm -hmm. we just take a minute and, and double click on that a little bit to say, yeah. all right, what what is holiness as a concept? Can we just really quickly define that? Mm -hmm. But then holiness as a movement, what is that? How are they different? Yeah, okay. yeah. So um, we have some good, some good language in our denominational literature for this, uh, mm -hmm. kind of about sanctification rather than holiness. But I'm just going to borrow okay. it. Um, yeah. whole, the idea of holiness is going to be lowercase h. Um, the idea of holiness is being set apart for God, becoming what God desires, and really it, it's something that's done by kind of a partnership of us and god um mm. so it, it's becoming more god like uh, now it doesn't mean that we get to be omnipotent and you know be mm. everywhere um i, I mean that I, last time i checked i don't know of anyone that's achieved that um <laughs> if you do please let scott me was close once I think you last were close. Summer, at was one close. time yes yeah, yeah right yeah <laughs> verging on omnipotence yeah, yeah. Right. um <laughs> change most things at will um yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we're becoming more like god in terms of character hmm. um and this idea that emerged in this pietist wesleyan kind of circles um is that that we were called to be set apart we were called to become a distinct people in christ a people who are like christ himself so that's kind of broad holiness. Um, they also get into this idea of uh, basically abstaining from sin. So so we're not just kind of stuck in having to constantly be sinful, um, but that we can become in this life people who choose not to sin. Uh, so that's lowercase h. Now, big H holiness is a overarching term for a series of movements and churches that are kind of like Wesleyanism, but can't be traced in terms of genealogy from Wesley. Um, so they're not part of the Methodist church formally. Um, they're, they're not, you know, founded by Wesley's great grandson or something like that. Yeah. Um, what, what these are is movements who say what these Wesleyans are doing is right that there is a need to pursue holiness, to be a holy people. Um, and we're going to, we're going to uh, grow in this by encountering God's spirit who will equip us to grow in holiness. How that plays out is very different depending on what movement you are a part of in within this broader holiness movement. So out of holiness, you get things like the Pentecostal movement. You get things like the Christian Missionary Alliance, um, several other groups that I'm blanking on. Um, but these are all people who say that we can encounter God's spirit. God will equip his people to become holy. Um, and sometimes it might be accompanied with specific phenomena, depending on the movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a few names that pop up in our denominational literature, um, that, that 
Brethren in Christ churches had interactions with, uh, predominantly in the Midwest region, um, Hepzibah Faith Missionary Association, the Iowa Fire Baptized Movement. Um, I mean, that sounds intense, uh, <laughs> but yeah. those are, those are holiness churches that that Brethren in Christ members interacted with, and and it seems like that might be where we received the Wesleyan holiness teaching from mm. is from those movements rather than interactions with the Methodist church. But I mean, at this mm. point in history, we're interacting with everybody. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. this is probably a dumb question, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Hey, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, Wesleyan... I can provide a dumb answer. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean the, the title of, let's see. Yeah, three streams. The title of your article, Three Streams, Brethren in Christ, uh, Theological Heritage. Okay, part three is Wesleyanism. Yeah. But but you talk about Wesleyanism and holiness. Yeah. That are they two different movements? They are two different movements, but I would make them kind of like siblings rather than cousins in okay. terms of theology. Um they 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 both have a shared set of core theological values. They differ in terms of practices and teachings, um, but but they both kind of come from this same familial vantage point of pursuing holiness and being able to be changed through encounters with the Spirit, that you might not find that sort of language in other theological traditions. So like Lutheranism and Calvinism, those would be cousins to these groups mm. because they have the same shared Protestant orientation, um, but their view of sanctification is a little bit, it, it's further away from these groups. They're kind of, uh, you know, you should be pursuing difference and that God will, you know, make you different at the, at the end. Um, uh, but, th but these are kind of more related in terms of how they think of sanctification. Okay. So, so Wesleyanism is the, let's call it the third stream, but hol holiness isn't necessarily the fourth stream, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. It, it's just a, had a, is it because it had a smaller impact or is it because yeah. it's under the umbrella of Wesleyanism? Yeah, I, I think when people refer to that as refer to the three streams, they're probably using Wesleyanism as an umbrella term okay. um, because holiness movements are influenced by it. Um, they're just kind of an offshoot. Um, so, yeah, usually they'll use Wesleyanism as the umbrella term for both of these groups. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like a Wesleyanism slash holiness. Other yeah. Then Wesleyanism and holiness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wesleyanism slash holiness. And then we yeah. deleted the second half because when you have two big words with a slash in between, it makes the line end weirdly on paper. You know, it's like <laughs> down to the next yeah. one, like yes. a third of the paper blank. <laughs> yeah. but, yes. Yeah. yeah. Can't we can't have that in our know. publications. We can't yeah. have that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool. So one of the things you said, Matthew, in there was uh, when you're talking about holiness is eventually you can like choose not to sin. Mm -hmm. And I think I think a lot of us, <clears throat> though, we may not have used those terms to say we can choose not to sin. I think we would all say that our journey of sanctification is such that we we grow in theory. We are growing in Christ likeness. Mm -hmm. And while we will never be perfect and while we will continue to be beset by sin, we can sin less because uh, through the working of the spirit in us, uh, we can grow in that regard. That said, there's a there's a phrase here in your mm -hmm. article, and I've seen in a lot of other BIC historical writings, yeah. entire sanctification. Mm -hmm. I So years and years ago, I was on a chat board, which is where all good things happen online. <laughs> Uh, it was it was a comment section on a, an old worship website, and th there was somebody on there who was really advocating for this position that you can achieve sinlessness in this life. Mm -hmm. It is possible through the work of the Spirit you can achieve sinlessness. And and I was like, I had never occurred that his, this had never I had never even heard of this. And so when I see a phrase like entire sanctification, my radar goes up. I'm like, whoa. What is this? So can you tell, talk to yeah. us a little bit about this? What does this mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and your experience on that chat board sort of brings out that with any theological language, there's 
everyone has their own nuance of what it means. Um, so, so you have a lot of different views on this. Broadly speaking, we're just going for dictionary type definitions. Mm -hmm. The idea of entire sanctification, which emerges out of Wesley and some of his followers, and then just kind of gets picked up by all these different people in the Wesleyanism and the holiness movements, is the idea that uh, that you can have encounters with God that so thoroughly purify your inner being that you no longer intentionally sin. I think that if we're being precise, at least among these early people, there might there probably wasn't the idea that you will never do anything wrong again by nature. So much as that you will your heart posture will be so tilted towards God that by default you will not sin. You will choose righteous approaches to whatever encounters you. Um, so I think that's what theologically they're getting at. Um, mm -hmm. That that you can be purified internally and that it reflects externally your actions. Um, now there's a few points to this that we can get into kind of sub points. Um, but, but how's that sound as a definition? <laughs> Scott, you look like you're about to say yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think it sounds I think it sounds good uh, as far as the definition goes, but I think it's relevant I think it's uh worthwhile to say what we're talking about mm -hmm. is in the time period of the 1770s to 1840 uh and it's um Methodist circuit preachers that were spreading these ideas. So this isn't necessarily yeah. brethren in Christ. We haven't right. gotten there yet, right? right. Okay. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah this is this is what Wesleyan uh, Methodist circuit preachers are teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But there there I've seen it in Brethren in Christ historical literature, you know, mm -hmm. saying that that this concept did come in to the point that they were, you know, there were debates during general assemblies and uh conferences about you know, how to include this kind of language in our articles of faith and doctrine kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And from what I understand, entire sanctification, I, gosh, I can't remember the, the BIC historians who are listening to this are going to have my <laughs> head, but I think it made it in at one point, like, like maybe yeah. even as a phrase, but then like came out again, it's like taken out again, but there, there's, there are some influences still in there a little bit, but I think the, the language has been softened a lot. Uh, to not use that, I don't think we'd find entire sanctification yeah. anywhere in our articles of faith and doctrine. But, um, but it it yeah. it was it was a heavy player for for at least a season in mm -hmm. Brethren in Christ history. Yeah, our history denominationally with this is very interesting. And um, again, at the risk of offending the historians that are listening to this, <laughs> I haven't read all of our denominational literature on this. Um, I haven't gone back to some of the older. Um, Manual Doctrine and Government Editions. But, tisk, tisk, Matthew. Uh, yes, on. I know. I'll get my <laughs> sackcloth now. Um, but but reading through reading through historical literature on our denomination, um, there is back and forth on particularly Wesleyanism. Um, now, part of the reason for this is that uh, the Anabaptist and Pietist components of our faith pre-date when we started writing things down. So we don't know what the debates yeah. were there because we kind of had already settled that before we started writing things um, in German too. Um, <laughs> and then they translate to English. Um, but but by the time that we get to this issue, um, you know, you see that, uh, you know, the holiness we start interacting with in the 1850s, 1870s. I mean, that's already about a century into our denominational history. Um, we have... Uh, evangelical visitor and some other resources that are already being published by then. People are arguing about stuff. Um, and there's a lot of back and forth on this issue. So you have people who are uh, encountering these holiness movements, encountering Wesleyanism and saying, I've seen what happens there. I've experienced this and my life is different. And then we have some of the uh, more Anabaptist inclined folks who are saying, okay, yes. Um, but there's some stuff that's going on to excess and is it manifesting in obedience or is it manifesting in just sort of experiences? Mm -hmm. um, so there's this back and forth push. It gets it, language gets put into the denominational literature and then like taken out and it's strengthened, weakened over time. Um, 
Uh, now, at present, I don't think the phrases entire sanctification or second work of grace uh, appear in our manual of doctrine and government. Um, mm -hmm. I, I flipped through it earlier today and I didn't see it. Um, so I, I think that we're operating now in kind of a broadly Wesleyan outlook, but not in one that would alienate people who are less Wesleyan in our heritage. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, so, so real quick, um, I yeah. feel like even though what we're talking about was a long time ago, it's it sounds very relevant to today and the churches in especially in the United States, like uh, the 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 kind of let's just for lack of a better word, call it religion or faith that that is based mostly on experience versus mm -hmm. so, something else so I, i'm i'm try i'm trying to i'm yeah. treading some thin ice here but um, <laughs> yeah. you know you know what i'm talking about so yeah. uh you know i'm wondering like so how do we land on that today do we even know i mean or is or are we so diverse that are we still you know talking about this kind of stuff at general conferences and whatnot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I, I think that we it's probably still something that we need to keep having conversations about. Um, the good thing about having these three streams is that we can kind of keep them in tension. And whenever anyone kind of pulls towards one side of the triangle too much, we'll just get back here a little bit. Mm. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. okay. On either end. Uh, well, either when we have three. <laughs> yeah. um, uh -huh. And any corner of any the triangle. <laughs> there you yeah. go. <clears throat> any end. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, that that fits into kind of where I was wanting to go next. So so we've talked a little bit about some defining some of the terms, a little bit of the historical uh, trajectory or, or, or uh, genesis of this influence into our denomination. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the perceived according to our own assessments and, and thoughts, some pros and cons of this movement's influence on the brethren yeah. in Christ. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's a bad way to put it. I don't know, <laughs> but just kind of what have been yeah. some of the influences of this denomination or of this, of this um, influence on our denomination, uh, yeah. pros and cons, if you want to put it that way, whatever. So Matthew, I'll let you go first. What are, what yeah. are some of your thoughts on, yeah. on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Pros, cons, strengths, weaknesses, that, that that's good language to have. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think what, if we, if we step back from the debate on kind of what sanctification looks like specifically mm -hmm. in terms of experiences, I do think that the Wesleyan emphasis on sanctification has been a pro uh, in the pro column because we I, I mean, biblically, I think that we're called to be different than those around us, <laughs> that something has to be different because the spirit is in the midst of our churches. Um, it doesn't need to look like what certain churches on TV make it look like. You know, no one needs to be falling over or anything. But the fact is that God is in the midst of our churches. He is among his people. Um, and something should look different. Um <laughs> because of yeah that. i mean yeah. you know we joked around about about verging on omnipotence before but when you have <laughs> the creator of the universe dwelling in the midst of a people group mm. it probably should look a little bit different than you know people getting together to hang out and play board games um and i like board games <laughs> but hey. um it should look different um yeah, yeah. than that um so I, I think that that's in a pro column. And I think that actually this is something that is important for our current context too. Um, because in American Christianity, there's a lot of folks out there who are demographically Christian, but who are for various reasons led into postures that are very hateful or judgmental towards others um and whose lives really don't look jesus like um i mean if you checked off on a bullet point you know of tithing and going to church on sundays and stuff like that you know they'd meet that criteria but there's nothing 
but but we're seeing this we're seeing a lot of instances where you have people who can speak in christianese um and have the right language have the right symbolism um and then do violent things which jesus i don't think wants us to do um i mean i'll have to check with him on that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that, that's a big pro um yeah, yeah. I, I yield the floor now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree, man. That the um, I think there's um, you know, so there there's a, a stereotype of like mm -hmm. the the Presbyterian Church, for instance, being very academic, mm -hmm. very of the book. A lot of the Bible studies are really in depth and take a lot of study and things like that. And then there are stereotypes of more uh, charismatic churches that are. Mm -hmm. Not that at all. Get the books away from me. We're about the experience of, you know, and like I said, these are stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what, and we talked about this before, one of the pros of having three streams of influence, at yeah. least as we have identified them traditionally, mm -hmm. um, is that it helps keep them all in a healthy tension. Yeah. Because uh, like you said, the, the emphasis on, their, on the spirit, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the heart, on a, you know, even the strange warming of the heart that John Wesley spoke of, the fact, I feel like God should be doing something. Mm -hmm. and we should be mm -hmm. noticing a change in some way. There should be something that happens. Our emotions should be engaged all the time, at all times, whether we are emotional or you know, tremendously emotive people, but our emotions should always be engaged as well mm -hmm. as our heads being engaged, our thoughts, uh, our actions. I, I believe, I, I think it helps to bring uh, a corrective to a potentially uh, very dry movement that may mm -hmm. have and pietism was helping to create fertile ground for wesleyanism to to sprout from and things like that yeah. um but um but yeah i think that's a, it's a very helpful uh perspective to bring into any denomination to keep to keep us from getting too heady and in our yeah. own selves and to remember that we're interacting with something so much bigger wilder and untamed than we could ever imagine or think of and mm -hmm that should change things. <laughs> it should change also what we expect too yeah. from a Sunday morning or from people's hearts or a, con a simple conversation with a neighbor or things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. There's something, uh, I mean, this is kind of a longer term project for me, but I'm interested in exploring kind of our church or ecclesiology to use the technical term um, in light of the fact that the spirit is in our midst. Um, mm. I, I, I've done, I'm actually working right now on something for the Great Lakes Conference that kind of talks about sanctification a little bit more, um, which I can share with you guys too. Um, and there's this phrase that pops up for me from First Peter, um, the idea that we are being built up into a spiritual house, um, that, that we as the church are God's current temple. And what makes a temple is not the building materials. What makes the temple is that the deity lives among it. Um, so, I mean, there's something to that, the idea that our churches are meant to be kind of miniature temples, places where God can be encountered um, in a stronger way um, that, that I, I'd be eager to explore a little bit more. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That gets a whole other set of wheels cranking in my head. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes, right? <laughs> right, cool. Well, Scott, do you have anything to add on there before we maybe look at some weaknesses or cons in the influence I, here? I don't know. Yeah. So what what do you think about some of the that maybe the cons or the weaknesses of yeah. this of this movement and its influence on the brethren in Christ? Yeah. Um I, I think it's been it's come up a little bit a couple times in our time together today. One tendency in this movement doesn't happen all the time but a tendency is to make individual experiences quote unquote normative um the, the fancy word for saying that this is how it happened for some people and this is how it must happen um i i, I i'll stress that i'm not thinking of anyone in particular here i'm really not um <laughs> uh there can be a tendency 
in amongst some folks who are big into holiness to sort of lay out a pattern of experiences that there's like one particular moment that you receive holiness. And if it doesn't look like that, then it didn't happen. Um, and I think that whenever we're trying to make the experience of a of one or a subset of people to be what everyone has to encounter, it becomes problematic um, because God is working amongst a diverse group of people. Um, so therefore, when he's at work, he is the same God, but there's a diverse group of people that he's working with. It should look a little bit different from person to person. Um, so uh, I think it was Rob Douglas might have used this language in the Theology of Salvation course a few months back. Um, the idea that for some people, the experience of sanctification is like an elevator that just kind of shoots you right up. And for other people, it's like the stairs where you kind of go up, you walk <laughs> a bit up, walk a bit up. Yeah. Um, the, the, the thing that should be unified in all of our experiences is that we are growing more Christ-like through the work of the Spirit. It might look different from person to person. And I think that um, like a good example of, of when, when people do this in a problematic way is um, some segments of Pentecostalism will say that you have not received the Spirit if you have not spoken in tongues. But Paul says that there are different gifts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that not everyone has that gift. So that's a problem when we're saying it has to look like this. Paul's saying, no, it, it, it doesn't have to look like that, but it does have to manifest in terms of love for others. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well said. That I think that's what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about how, you know, the those issues in the 17 and 1800s that they were talking about sounds uh, uh, very familiar. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you yeah. hit the nail on the head for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times uh, for me, the word that comes up is a, a legalistic tendency. And when it comes to our experiences, you know, oftentimes when I think of legalism, I think in terms of obedience, this is how you are to dress. This is the kind of music you're allowed to listen to. This is, you can't have piercings. You have to wear your hair a certain way, you know, things like that. Um, that I think a, a number of us would say, yeah, that's, that's silly. That has no bearing on one's spirit or uh, you know, character or anything like that. But with this, as it gives a helpful corrective, as we, as we said before, to help us lean more into the spirit and to the heart and engaging of emotions and things like that, um, there can then be a legalism in that regard to say, as you were saying, Matthew, that one, th this experience is what you should be experiencing at conversion, or you need to have this kind of feeling or this kind of experience, or it should lead you to do this or this or this, you know, um, it can, yeah, it can be rather legalistic when it comes to conversion, uh, which then can lead people to question their own salvation at times if theirs didn't look like someone else's or mm -hmm. like their mentors or their parents or whatever. Um, it can lead to all kinds of doubts and <laughs> all kinds of things yeah. uh, when taken to the extreme. For sure. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, I, we have we have some time here. So as we've done with the other uh, streams, Anabaptism and Pietism, I would like to take just a quick look at some of the Brethren in Christ core values, the 10 core values that our denomination uh, has kind of set out for itself to kind of say, this is this is what we're about, you know. Uh, so I would like to take a look at those 10 core values and, and see all right, which ones where do we do we see this Wesleyan influence, this holiness influence in here? So, yeah, uh, Matthew, what do you think? You want to take the first one? Sure. What do you see? And, and I can actually take the very first one that's listed. Yeah. Experiencing God's love and grace. Mm. Um, I, I mean, if we can do kind of a takeaway from this discussion of Wesleyanism, it is about encountering God and being changed mm. by it. Um, I, I like the language that. Paul uses in, I think it's 2 Corinthians, of that we are, uh, 
he's talking about, he makes an analogy to Moses, but he says that we are beholding God's glory with unveiled faces mm -hmm. and are transformed into his likeness. Um, I think that that gets to, I mean, that's a theme that the Wesleyans kind of adopt and that we have adopted from them, that we are experiencing God and being changed by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Experiencing God's love and grace. And then the line beneath that, we value the free gift of salvation in Christ Jesus and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And mm -hmm. it really smacks of Wesleyanism and the experiential part of things. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, do you have one popping up for you? Uh, I would have picked the first one, but, but he stole it. <laughs> I saw your so, thunder. He's, he's he stole, stole mine. my answer. He stole mine. <laughs> well, I was looking at I was looking at the, the third one. They're worshiping God. We value heartfelt worship mm. that is God honoring, spirit directed, and life changing. Uh, mm. Again, a, a, an emphasis on encountering the spirit, um, yeah. the heartfelt worship, uh, and the life changing aspect of things. How it should it should affect the practical how we live uh, type of stuff. So I feel like that a lot of the word choices in that in that explanation of of our the third core value there of worshiping God uh, really come for me from that stream of influence for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then yeah. I also looking at the fourth one, following Jesus, we value wholehearted obedience to Christ Jesus through, and this is where it really feels like for me, through the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, mm -hmm. Again, spirit enabled change. The spirit is the power behind any of those changes. So yeah. real quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, uh, uh, Wesleyan holiness movement really emphasizes like the work of the spirit, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Did the An Anabaptists and pietists not really emphasize it as much or, or, or what? I think it's a matter of degree and kind of how they talk about the spirit. Um, so the, An and, and part of it is that each of these movements is formed in response to problems that existed. Oh, yeah. So Anabaptists, they're responding to this situation where it kind of seems like everyone's turning the gospel into a political tool for emerging states. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, really, we're we're being formed as a obedient community and not sort of, you know, Prince, whatever his name of Saxony wants to have his own little kingdom. Everyone will be baptized mm -hmm. into that faith. Um mm -hmm. The pietists are coming from the situation of when everything gets very heady and academic and we're excommunicating everyone because of theological minutiae. Um, and they're saying, well, it, no, it's it's really, it, it's about this lived experience. Um, so I, I think that the, both of them would have emphasized that the spirit is responsible for this. It's just that the Wesleyans and the holiness folk are a little bit more emphatic in their discussion of the spirit because they were looking for how do we become this redeemed, restored community and, and seeing some deficiencies that were due to a lack of experiential knowledge of God. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. a good summation there, Matthew. That's, that's yeah. good. Like All right. That. <laughs> Put that on the back of a book or something. I yeah. like that. <laughs> there you that's go. good, man. <laughs> Just give us a plug. That's a, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was great. Man, Matthew, thank you so much uh, for all the work that you've been doing with that series, uh, posting that, and and again, we'll have we'll have the link to that. Is that published yet? I know you sent us kind of like yes. an advanced copy. Yeah, it, it, it's it's published, so you can you can share yeah. it. Yeah, fantastic. So we'll get the link on that in our show notes. Please, uh, listener and watcher, viewer, however you're taken in this podcast, do go check it out because we're just hitting the highlights here. The articles are really accessible, uh, very, you know, easy to read and yet Ooh. still get us, <laughs> yet still help us to have a nice overview of, of some of these, these uh, really big topics. Uh, so, and if you're uh, pursuing your doctrinal questionnaire, if you're, if you're, taking your core courses, uh, these, these episodes could be really good to, to check out, to kind of get some primer on these uh, three streams to help you as you 
as you think through uh, your home here in the Brethren in Christ. So, all right, well, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Matthew, thank you for being here yet again. Uh, we <laughs> appreciate uh, your, your expertise, your generosity of time, and your uh, Hobbiton uh, picture behind your, over your shoulder there. We appreciate <laughs> yeah, yeah. all of that. And uh, <laughs> so thank you for being here. Uh, listener Pleasure. viewer, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to check out our website, biclifepodcast.com and our Patreon, patreon.com slash biclifepodcast. Love to see you there and partner with you to bring some more content to see how we can learn about and grow in our love and appreciation for our denomination where we find ourselves. Uh, but also to help, mainly to help serve God's church. The brethren in Christ are not the only expression of God's church here in this world. Um, we're just the one, this is just where we happen to have found our home. So we hope you learned something about the denomination here. Um, and we'll catch you next time. See you next month. Hey, thanks for listening to the BIC Life Podcast. Brethren in Christ churches exist to follow Jesus, serve others, and make disciples. If you're looking for more information about the BIC denomination, or if you're just looking for one of our local churches, head over to BICUS.org. And if you'd like to get in touch with us at the podcast, you can do so by emailing us at BICLifePodcast at gmail.com, or you can head over to our website, BICLifePodcast.com. Dot com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. We're, well, that kind of answers my question, because I was going to ask, how how is it coming in for you guys? And I'm assuming it probably hasn't much yet. No, <laughs> no one no. knows about it except for us. Now you oh, know about it. So, man. But wait, uh, do you, wait, do you hear about uh, the, the tears that yeah, the uh, tears Ryan came up with? Supporting tears. Oh. So, very excited. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> So anyway, I, uh, yeah, we're we're just giving it a try. Right now, we pay pay for all this stuff through mm -hmm. from our own pockets. So we yeah, figured, yeah. you know what? Let's set up a Patreon. If people want to support us, that'd be great. If cool. not, fine. So yeah, that's quite the pitch there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's oh, it gets even better. <laughs> you know. Wait till you actually hear what I'm going to say. So <laughs> you get nothing for supporting us. Yeah. yeah. Nothing. Brown Brownie points. Man. Super super kudos from us. But yeah. Yeah, you, you, not even like a frisbee with your faces on it or something. We I mean, got nothing, man. Maybe someday, maybe someday yeah. there will be some merch. But until I guess the, you know, the typical thing not to talk about this here, but real quick, the typical thing <laughs> to do with Patreons is to list them at the end of your videos and like scroll through or just a, mm. you know whatever. I that's easy enough to do. I I could do that. Yeah, uh, we could we could do that. Give a special mention to our supporters, but. Um, Right it's, now, we don't yeah, have any, yeah. so it's a non-issue at this <laughs> point. Go. So, right, <laughs> it's just something we're trying out. See if it, uh, see if anybody feels like helping us out a little bit. Yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll throw in this for the future. Whenever you guys get around to the the swag end of things, yeah. is you need to do the official Bic Life Bic Lighter. Okay, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. A, a lighter. Or yeah. or big pens, the big life big yeah. pens. Yeah, that's there true. We could we could do both of those. There you go. I feel like the lighter might. I don't know. That might send the wrong message. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just make clear that it's only for lighting advent candles. All right. Oh, yeah, it's only for lighting so advent good. candles. Yeah. There you go. It's it's to signify yeah. the the flame of the Holy Spirit inside yeah. us. We're we're turning. There that's our Wesleyan. That's wow. our Wesleyan roots. There is the, the flame wow. of the Methodism. What what a segue. <laughs> yeah, we got we got some yeah. ideas.